Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Star Citizen Live Game Dev Let There Be Light. I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. And if you've never seen Star Citizen Live before, that's where we take an, about an hour out of our Fridays at the end of our week and we goof off. Sometimes we answer some questions, sometimes we review some process, uh, sometimes we sit down with uh, one of our developers and uh, we, let, we let them uh, take us on a guided tour of their work. And when that happens, we call those episodes our game dev episodes, and that's what we're doing this week. Joining us on the show this week is a esteemed guest from our lighting team, Mr. Chris Campbell. Chris, how you doing? Hey, good thanks, Jared. How are you this morning? Good. I'm all right. Uh, thank you for agreeing to take the time out of your of, of everybody's busy schedule as we're heading into the 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 the, 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 the final furlough of Alpha three one here. Uh, sure. I know or three 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 one one. I did it. Three one takes me back. <laughs> yeah. Do I look like I know what year it is? It's <laughs> time is 2018. We're you know, uh, as we're approaching 311. Uh, what are we doing today? You are, you are of course, a uh, uh, what is it? Lead lighting? Yeah, I'm, I'm Grand the lead Poobah. lighting artist for the right. Persistent Universe. All right. And what are we what are we doing today? Uh, so I just thought we would do like a quick kind of relight ish of a, a surface outpost on Hurston. Okay. And, and 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 the purpose of this is to is to kind of show us a little bit about your process, what goes into it. Uh, uh, you, you know, we've had a lot of talks offline. Uh, lighting is some is is one of the lighting and sound are, are, are two of my little uh, pet projects with with game development because I, I I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what goes into it, uh, what makes good or effective lighting and stuff like that. So um so we're gonna explore some of that process today. Uh, yep. If you want. You're the driver on the passenger today, so you can start your screen share, and uh, we'll just jump right into it. Okay. Share that there. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I'll try and keep uh, keep some of the boring technicalities out of it and focus on kind of making something cool and, uh, yeah, just going through kind of my process of exploring a, a space and uh, and kind of figuring out something to do with it. So, so yeah, I've basically got this... Uh, this little habitation outpost, uh, which I've put on Hurston. Um, I've got uh, access to the, the sun time of day, so I can quickly and easily change the time of day, which is going to be useful. Um, but of course, everyone loves a good sunset, so we can we can start <laughs> off there, I think. Um, Does it ever make you so just feel powerful, just being able to grab the sun like that and just be like... Oh, I wish I could do that in real life. Just make it sunset all day long. Right. So yeah, uh, just to start with, this is this is kind of what what everyone should uh, already know uh, from from the insides of these um, these habitation units. Uh, and so what I've done is I've done like a kind of very rough, quick redressing pass, um, mostly just because uh, without it, you know, the lighting's very functional. It's all kind of built into the um, the structure uh, and. While there's there's a lot you can do when you're kind of building a, a space like this, you can kind of design the lighting to fit in nice and neatly. Um, but since we're going to go a little bit crazy, having a bit more freedom and a little bit more uh, places and locations <laughs> where we can kind of throw lights and cast weird shadows and stuff like that, um, yeah, this is a this is going to be a good starting point. All right, so it's a hold on, you you just uh, turned on a layer or whatever. So you, you, this you started with the base model. Uh, Rayari hab, and exactly. then before the stream here, you've spent some time redressing this. Yes, yeah, exactly. I it's a uh, maybe a little bit of cheating, but I don't think anyone wants to watch <laughs> me do horrible environment art dressing work. Uh, I'll leave that to the the pros in that department. I was gonna say, has this been validated by the environment art? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Do they know and, you're and going rogue here? Apologies to Ian um, for destroying his hab here. Okay. Uh, cool. So um, I'll basically I'll turn off what's already there, um, and we'll kind of kick it off from there. So that's the the old lights now gone. Uh, what I will do is I'll keep all the cube maps because I think again that's kind of I mean it's a it's a very critical part of the job is kind of laying out cube maps for the best ambient lighting. But uh, no one wants to watch me do that for an hour as well. So I'll use the existing cube maps. Well, let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what a cube map is, though, because a cube map is incredibly important to 
lighting in the lumberyard engine. So yes. uh, just introduce us to the concept of QMAPs. Yeah, sure. So the QMAP is, um, or the environment probe, is kind of the the absolute fundamental part of our lighting kind of workflow. So all without it, you know, we've just got basically a pitch black interior. Um, it's pitch black because it's uh, all uh, interior and, and hidden away uh, using vis areas and stuff, which basically means that you start from absolutely zero lighting. Uh, and what a an environment probe does is you kind of place a... Um, kind of like a, an area of, of effect. Uh, in this case, these are all kind of cubes and with a little bit of softness on them. And uh, and what they do is they they capture uh, what's called a cube map, which is just like a, a texture, which is captured from like, a, imagine that each one of these has like a little camera pointed in all six directions of the cube. It takes a screenshot and then reprojects that ambient light uh, into all four directions. So the more that you have, theoretically, the more detail you can get in your ambient lighting. Um, these are generally approximations. Uh, so, I mean, for example, like on this side um, of, uh, of this uh, bed over here, it's actually receiving the light from this cube map. Um, so if I turn that one off, then it gets more lighting from this cube map and, and vice versa. So uh, at the moment, yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Chat, I, I want you to say that I, I see your puns and they, they are sustaining me. Keep them going. Um, so that that's what a cube map is. But wh why do we yep. need cube maps? Uh, wh wh why is this the is is why are cube maps necessary? Uh, well, without them, and uh, unfortunately, still still not having uh, any kind of ray tracing or something like that, um, you need ambient lighting in the game. Uh, you know, a long time ago. Uh, you would just have kind of a, a consistent ambient value, which would be like some kind of gray or blue or taken from the sky color. So I don't know, some kind of orange. And that would just be projected throughout the entire world in kind of a, a uniform way. Um, but cube maps allow us to uh, kind of account for um, occlusion based on like the window, for example, uh, or the ceiling or the floor, which makes things then appear darker, which gives you more... Um, uh, depth of contrast between like the interior, which is nice and dark here, versus the exterior uh, out there. Okay. Uh, yeah. And the the brighter it gets outside, I I'm not sure how easily some of this will pick up on stream, but the brighter it gets on the outside, uh, the cube maps will recapture, uh, and then you'll get like even more kind of light spilling in. So if we don't have any lights at all, uh, you get already this kind of nice base ambient lighting. Um, look yeah and uh, nice. if you want to actually see the cube maps i can turn on like this little uh debug mode um and i'll turn off the screen space reflections so this is basically like all of the cur all of the materials have just turned into like a a, a glossy kind of like a chrome mirror for example mm -hmm. and this shows you what each of the cube maps kind of reflection maps are picking up so obviously towards the uh, the windows you're getting a lot of this uh, exterior lighting and that's getting uh, reprojected in into the the room. So when I turn it back on, uh, you can see like these highlights coming in uh, on the the more reflective surfaces. And this is without any additional lighting whatsoever. So this is just the base kind of ambience. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's where so, we'll start. So so we know like the so we uh, we know one of the the current hotness in video cards and everything is ray tracing. Yeah. And stuff like that. But not everybody will have a card that's capable of doing ray tracing. Oh, no, exactly. So, right. I mean, it's an, it's an extremely intensive, uh, graphically heavy process. Um, and uh, I think it's it's still a ways out for a lot of game development, um, but uh, obviously something that we we want to explore at some point for sure. Oh, yeah. Only we we will have a couple unique challenges. We'll have to f figure out how it works with a 360 degree, fully realized planet and exactly all that stuff. So we we we'll have some challenges. Maybe some other folks may not, but uh, it's definitely something that we're we, we intend to pursue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but in the meantime, environment probes. In the meantime, we've got cube maps and environment probes, and uh, that's you know that's that's good enough for like kind of 95 percent of cases. So, 
Yeah. Right. So I apologize for derailing you. you no, that's that's continue. totally fine. Um, derail away. Uh, okay, so I find the topic very illuminating. <laughs> I totally stole right. that from chat. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, uh, I I mean I don't know. I don't know if it, it's probably just me, but I already really like uh, looking at scenes where there are there's no lighting and it's basically just simulations of the. Um, the exterior lighting kind of bouncing around in an interior. I always think that looks really cool. You get lots of nice uh, reflections and stuff like that. So uh, you'll have to forgive me if I, I might noodle around a bit and just kind of look at certain angles. Um, but that's also kind of part of the lighting process is uh, like finding good kind of, I guess what we would call like screenshot moments mm -hmm. uh, where you find like a nice kind of, uh, a nice kind of framing um, with like some nice dark spots some nice lighting spots. Uh, and then we can kind of build from there. So like, uh, yeah, like here, for example, get some nice spill through here. It's getting a little bit dark over there. And so maybe we'll, we can start adding some light back there and just see what happens. Yeah, by all means, you do you. All righty. You just then, tell us what you're doing. All right, I'm going to add a light. There we go. And we're done. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's lighting for you. Uh, no, so uh, obviously... Just adding in a light by default just gives me a nice kind of white, very boring light by itself. But uh, obviously, you want to see what you're doing. So um, I mean, a lot of people may notice where some of these props come from. Uh, when I was building this uh, this dressing, I was kind of thinking it's maybe some guy who works in Lorville uh, and he's kind of a little bit fed up of the Hurstons and he's maybe stolen some stuff uh, from Lorville and he's brought it out to his little drug stash. He uh, stole some away. pictures. Of, he stole <laughs> yeah. pictures of the people that he hates and hung them exactly. on his wall. He, he broke in there and then he wants to, you know, graffiti them up a little bit. All right. Again, apologies to the environment art team. Hey, no, no, we're just learning more <laughs> about you than anything else. Yeah, right. All right. So I'm gonna start with uh, maybe like these. These props already have uh, some light fixtures built into them. Um, so I think what could be cool to start with is just like some little kind of dim. I don't know, lighting or information over here uh, just to make it a little bit less flat. I'm going to turn this guy on. Let's start with a nice dim kind of intensity. I'm going to link the light to the picture frame, which then, uh, so each, uh, each asset or material can have like a glow assigned to it, and that can sometimes be controlled by a, a light source once we link it to it. Um, and then let's make this a projector light, and we'll give it just a simple kind of projection. Widen it up a little bit, and we're off to our start. So that's kind of cool. It's almost a little bit uh, horror movie-esque, like kind of the, the pictures following mm -hmm. you along the wall. Uh, let's go with something a little bit warmer in color, maybe. But I think cause this guy is a little bit sick, so we'll use a lot of like kind of greenish, greenish yellows and stuff like that. Um, we'll reduce the radius because we're always thinking about performance. Um, let's expand it a little bit. Let's make it a little bit brighter. Uh, you, you mentioned performance very casually no. there but <laughs> it's there's always got to be th th this ever looming shadow this presence over everything you do where yeah you it, it it's you have to resist the urge to go hog wild or crazy but at the same time one of the tenants of star citizen is always pushing the envelope as they say you know as far as we can how do you how do you balance that exactly i mean yeah as you say we're 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 certainly not shying away from expensive uh, lighting setups and and you know kind of pushing the boundaries there, um, but at the same time, um, yeah, obviously we want to we want people to be able to run the game uh, at a, a somewhat decent frame rate. Uh, so when we're when we're building our lighting uh, for environments, we always just try and keep it in the back of our mind like some rough guidelines of how many lights we can use, uh, how many shadow casting lights we can use. Um, and how many lights are overlapping in the scene at any given moment. And those are just kind of things that we, um, 
we f you feel out as you as you work on the project a little bit more. Um, so I've got some some numbers in my head, um, and uh, yeah, it's just it's more a habit at this point. So I just kind of try and stick with it. I don't want to you know reveal too much of the magician's secrets but uh, you, you you mentioned it shadow casting lights uh yes. the existing of a shadow casting light implies the existence of lights that don't cast shadows <laughs> yes exactly um yeah so for example i mean you know especially for demonstration purposes we want it to look as good as possible so i'm i'm turning on shadows quite often um but probably probably, I guess, like 80% of the lights that we're placing generally don't cast shadows. And uh, the the basic kind of thought process there is that if it's if it's some kind of uh, ambient light or it's just kind of acting as a fill for the environment, uh, you don't always need to have shadows turned on. So like, for example, um, let's say that this was quite bright. Let's make it a little bit brighter. Um, and this is, again, like kind of one of those things where when you don't have ray tracing, um, and the kind of methods that offline renderers use, you have to kind of fake a lot of things. Um, so in this example, like there's no bounce light coming from this uh, this light here hitting the floor and then like shining back up. Um, you know, if I turn it off and on, there's no difference in this, uh, this part of the frame. Right. So uh, what we'll do sometimes is we'll add like a kind of a bounce light uh, or a fill kind of light. Um, and in this case, I'll... Just extend the bulb a little bit so it's a bit softer. I'm kind of thinking that I want the light source to be about as big as the um, the cone of this light hitting this uh, this pile of dirty laundry on the floor. So I'll bring that down to about there. And then uh, lighting is, is pretty much all about ratios. So it's all about how bright is your key light and then how bright are the subsequent bounce and fill lights and that kind of stuff to create contrast uh, in your scene. So right now this this fill light is just way too bright. Uh, so I'd bring that way down and even more than that, probably even more than that. And so now it, it's very subtle, but it just adds a little bit of that kind of greenish uh, light kind of bouncing up into the ceiling and uh, and against these, these areas. Uh, and this light, because it's so subtle in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't need shadow casting to go back to your initial point. So key lights, shadow casting, fill lights, no shadow casting. It, 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 it's always a hard balance because yeah, in an ideal situation, of course, every single light would be shadow casting and, and it, it, ray tracing would be on everything. And, you know, you, obviously, in an, you, 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 want, you want to push these things as far as possible, but the perform performance is... And optimization is such an important consideration these days. You always yes, exactly. you, you take it to the you take it to the point of looking awesome, and then you often have to scale it back, uh, you know, by degrees to get to the point where it's performative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, we 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 try and replicate the real world as much as possible, and you know, in the real light, in the real world, I'm not sure I've I've heard of a, a light source that doesn't cast shadows. Um, that would be interesting. Um, so that's that's obviously the goal, but then the the realities of kind of computer graphics uh, tends to get in the way of that sometimes. Hmm. All right. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm basically just like kind of putting in um, whatever I feel is going to kind of help the scene. Uh, so one thing that I like to always try and add is a little bit of movement in the lighting. Um, that also it helps, especially in our engine, like a, a lot of other engines use um, baked uh, lighting, which then tends to be very static. And, you know, once it's baked, that's kind of how it looks. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, our engine is and always has been like purely dynamic. Uh, the only thing that is baked would be kind of these cube maps. Uh, and even then we we update and refresh those every now and then. Um, so it's always nice to, to make the most out of that uh, those dynamic lights by you know making them move around or uh, adding a little bit of uh, extra animation and stuff like that to kind of help it out. Right. You're talking about the uh, the recently updated uh, runtime probes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So all of these probes are are set to be runtime. So I'm not manually rebaking them. 
Um, but I do sometimes will I'll just select them all and then kind of hit refresh to force them to update uh, in case they're not updating fast enough for my tastes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to create another light. Uh, from the chat, uh, what is the exposure control in a scene? If you brighten it up a few stops, uh, does it change the scene much? Do, do we control exposure? Um, we, uh, from it on an artist perspective, we don't control the exposure itself directly uh we kind of we control the exposure through how bright we make our lighting um and in the background we have this kind of auto exposure system uh which you know has like a maximum brightness range and, and a, a darkness uh range and then it kind of you know tries to strike a balance in between uh, so i've got these buttons up here which will let me kind of force the exposure to a certain um, almost kind of like an f-stop, but it's actually it's a, an EV value, an exposure value. Mm. Um, so like this, for example, I've got it locked to an EV of 10, uh, which works fine kind of outside. Um, uh, and then, you know, once you get inside, the, the darker areas start getting really, really dark, uh, almost pitch black. And so without it, um, the auto exposure can kind of kick in and then lift those areas. Uh, and that's kind of how you get like kind of blown out outdoors. Um, and then, um, you know, when you're outside looking in, then you'd get kind of like a darker looking interiors from a distance uh, hmm. until you kind of enter them. So that's kind of how we work with our dynamic range. Um, but we don't actually have any individual control. Like, say, if I wanted this room specifically to be a certain um, exposure brightness, I, I don't have that control. Uh, which is fine because we have so many locations in our game having that extra level of control just means more time tweaking it, it more more opportunities for bugs to appear that kind of stuff yeah. um, I know uh, star citizen and lumberyard support uh, HDR how does that how does that affect your work um, like uh, HDR monitors or yeah like, like your monitor, like high dynamic range monitors and stuff does that does that do, 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 does that play a factor in how you light a scene? Um, not so much, actually. I, uh, the the HDR um, system is kind of like a it's a back end kind of a graphics uh, system, which will. Um, I mean, I can't. I don't know the technicals, so you'd have to ask someone like Ali. Yeah. Um, but uh, basically, it's all kind of uh, behind the scenes. So it, it takes whatever we've lit, and then it uh, it you know pushes things in certain in certain directions to uh, to work for HDR. So, I mean, another kind of thing that I do when I am lighting a scene is, uh, I mean, one of the kind of things that um, that Ian really likes as a, our environment art director um, is he likes lots of, like, kind of low-angle glancing uh, lights. Um, and this, this comes from, you know, a lot of the art direction of our game comes from Roger Deakins and uh, um, uh, James Cameron... Uh, you know, like aliens and that kind of stuff, uh, kind of 80s, 90s um, sci-fi movies. Mm. And, uh, you know, in cinematics uh, and movies, you've always got very low lights. You've always got lots of, like, specular highlights and stuff like that. Um, and so sometimes when I'm I'm looking to start lighting a scene, I'll just kind of place a light uh, and just kind of look around for, again, kind of looking for those moments where I can see, like, you know, like, oh, maybe I really like how the light pings off this uh, this locker here and gives me a nice hot spot down there. And then when I find a, a spot where I, I like the light, uh, then I'll try and find a way to motivate it either by adding a, a light fixture there or, you know, something glowing or some reason for the light to be there. Because um, generally we, we want to minimize how many lights just exist in the world but don't actually have a, a source. Right. I was, I was actually going to be my next question. Uh, we started this by... Start working with one of the lights that were already there in the scene, with the light that was uh, embedded at the top of the picture frame. But yeah, as you, as you work and as you go through, my next question was: How many times do you have to do? Do you have to go back to the environment artist or the prop artist and ask for a light here or there so that so that you can motivate your uh, design decisions? Yeah, that. That's uh, that's usually something that we try and do um, as early in the process as possible. So, like the environment art team will will block out a, a location, 
um, and then we'll we'll come in and, and set up our cube maps and all the kind of technical basics, um, and at the same time try and think about where we want our key lights to come from, and uh, if we need to request any changes to the geometry or or uh, the layout to accompany that, um, then that's that's usually the best time to do it, because um, uh, later on when art starts getting final, it's uh, it gets a little a little tight to request these kinds of changes. Right. So I kind of like where this uh, this light is here. Um, I'm going to give it a, a light fixture, uh, and I'm just going to fly down to. I've kind of got a an asset zoo under the planet of uh, all of the lighting fixtures that we <laughs> tend to use in the game. Um, this yeah, actually so exists under the planets in the in the prisons and universe too, guys. If you, if, oh, oh yeah, if, sometimes <laughs> if you can find you, it. If you if sometimes if you, if you fall, fall through the planet at the right place, you can find our asset zoos. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a guy I like to use often. So I'll basically just. I, I, I'm kidding about that. Don't don't tell Ian I said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this absolutely does not exist in the in the game. I'd be in a lot of trouble. I get an email so, from Ian. Did you yeah. did you tell people we left lights under the planet? <laughs> Here we go. And now I've got it. Kind of just roughly rotate it, and then I'm gonna. That's not to say sometimes there's not something left under the planet on accident that has happened. That does happen. Well, that, you know, that, that does happen sometimes. Spawn, uh, <laughs> completely unintentionally where they shouldn't spawn. Yeah. That happens in almost every video game. You just yeah. find a random asset somewhere where it's not supposed to be, and it's like, oops. Yeah, but that's sometimes that's part of the fun is finding something that shouldn't be there. So... Uh, so yeah, I mean, one other thing, like why I'm in this uh, this kind of debug view, um, as a lighting artist, you're often working in extremely dark locations, and it, you know, if you're trying to, it would be like in real life trying to like put a, a light source while you're staring directly at it and figuring out where it goes against the wall. Uh, so sometimes I, I just turn on this um, this debug that just uh, removes all lighting information and just shows me the uh, the albedo textures, and then I can see where I want to actually place my my light source. Do you know what albedo means? Ooh, that's uh, you're putting me on the spot there. I mean, I I know roughly what it, I I don't know what the the origin of the word is. I assume it's probably Latin or something. Sorry, right. I've asked this question <laughs> on three different shows where, where it's come up like this, and nobody's had the answer. So it's just a curiosity. I know, yeah. but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, okay, right. I mean, it's uh, I mean, the albedo itself is like the um, it's, it's like an index for how much light. A, a a material reflects uh, from its surface. Oh, all right, there you go. But the word itself, I don't know. All righty. So we've got this guy, and again, like uh, it's it's very dark back up in the corners, and you'd expect some level of balance. I think having this uh, hit down here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add a a simple kind of uh, bounce light and see see where we go with that. And a lot of lighting. Uh, just ends up being um, quite a bit of like trial and error and just figuring stuff out. The more you do it, then uh, you kind of get a feeling for what is more likely to work than not. Um, but there's there's still a lot of kind of exploration that goes into it. So there we go. So now we've got like some nice kind of highlights up here, filling out the room a little bit and more. Without it, it's uh, it's a little bit too contrasty. Then uh, yeah, it's always good a good idea to remember to like refresh the probes because they will. The more light you add, the more light gets picked up by the probes, and then once the probes get recalculated, the scene gets brighter, and then maybe that's too bright, and then you you have to kind of balance the lighting back and forth. That's uh, a lot of balancing acts, but it actually looks kind of cool from this uh, this side as well. Um, earlier in the show, you said you had some numbers in your head uh, yeah. when we were talking about performance. Uh, is there anything you could, you can share? The, one of the questions that was coming from the chat is was asking if you had a percentage quotient that you that you that you aim for when doing something like this. Sure. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, lights that we have on screen, our general rule of thumb is to keep it around, or well, not around, but under like two hundred and eighty lights uh, on screen at any given moment, um, and you may. 
think that that's like a lot and how would you ever get to that kind of number um but i mean especially in a sci-fi game almost all <laughs> light sources are man-made light sources uh yeah. and uh, you've got spaceships which all have lights built into them and you've got players running around with their flashlights and all of these kind of things add up to that that total yeah. uh so we actually we hit that limit frequently and uh and we hit it hard So I'm going to counteract the blue from this light. I'm just going to make this one a warmer color instead. If I was coming in here, I'd want my, my three identical jumpsuits to, uh, to be the main focus here. So I'll just angle it a little bit more towards on the, uh, the suits themselves. And when, you, and when you said 180 lights, it was 180, right? That's what you said. Uh, 280. 280. 280. So when you said 280 lights, that's on screen at any one time. So that's not even like in a scene. It's just wherever no, exactly. a that's person can in, look. In this camera frame. Time. So like yeah. there could be another 280 lights behind me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, as long as it's only in the in the frame, then that's kind of good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, some, some environments like uh, big city locations and stuff, you know, the total number of lights in that location could easily exceed like a thousand or two thousand um, lights that we actually end up placing and then we we use as many tricks as we can to kind of keep that number down per frame um, yeah so we got those guys all right cool uh just as i'm just going to offer a correction to some things i'm seeing in chat uh rtx sure. was not answered as no uh we do not have ray tracing in right now uh it is something that we want to investigate and explore in the future so yeah. there, 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 there was not a no to ray tracing as i'm seeing some people in chat uh regurgitate it's just yep. on the list and there are other priorities ahead of it that's all I mean, again, I don't want to. I don't want to step on Ali's shoes too much here, but um, you know, before we even start talking about ray tracing, we have to get the Gen 12 renderer um, yeah. up and running, and that's kind of the main priority, I think, for the graphics team. Yeah. Just like all things in game development, priorities. You can't. Fortunately, we can't work on everything all at the same time. Exactly. Let me try and find something else to use here. Thinking. Thinking of something for his desk, so I want like a, I don't know, like a, like a desk light, I guess. So let's see if we've got something in here. <laughs> so, a lot, a lot of lights. The job is. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna improvise a little bit. I'm sure, there's some props artist that's like, I've, <laughs> yeah, I, I've made 300 different light <laughs> fixtures. Yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah, but if they don't tell us that they made it, then then I don't know it exists. Okay. He's looking kind of bright in here. That's that's a bit of a worry. Let's not use him. Um, where do we keep the... Oh, this kind of looks like a desk light. Let's use that. But yeah, we we certainly have a a lot of uh, props in this game. It can be very daunting trying to look through them for something. Oops. I'm gonna put this in here. There we go. Uh, I'm just gonna create a new light. Put it up here. Link it. Is that linked? Let me see. No. Mesh light. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Same process. And add a texture. Let's use something a little bit different now. Let's go with this one. Here. 
and of course it's slightly offset which makes my my life a little bit harder so now i have to manually kind of drag it into place it's all about all about finding the right camera angle to move something five centimeters mm -hmm. All right, that's that there. Let's widen it up. Let's turn on the shadows. The link the light to the actual um, mesh itself, and then I can like drag them around together and find a, a decent kind of position for it. Uh, we've had some questions about the uh, aspect ratio you're working in. This looks like what yes. twenty twenty one nine. Uh, yeah, something like that. It's um, it's uh, an ultra wide uh, Asus Predator. You're not getting paid. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll it, I'll take my check now, Asus. <laughs> uh, is that just? Is there an advantage for your workflow to work in a ultra wide, or is it just something you like? Um, initially, I like when I first got it. It it took a little bit of time to kind of get used to having such like a wide screen because I, I like having more vertical space as well like especially when you start get, having like all these properties to adjust um, you can never have enough vertical space but uh, the more that I've worked with it definitely um, it's absolutely awesome for having just like a massive uh, viewport that you can work with um, and at the same time like uh, you know the more cinematic you want to get obviously the wider the screen uh, and then it it just makes it really easy to like get those kind of cinematic angles uh, and and wide kind of letterbox uh, moments. Um, so that's good. But definitely, what helps more is a second monitor, which uh, is not being shared at the moment. Where I've got like, it's just toolbars and uh, and other kind of tool windows. Um, would be impossible without a second monitor for sure. Okay. Every time you go back to this section i just think about how we should open up like the like a lamps plus store <laughs> in reverse that would be kind of cool. it's a ch chain we have here in the states a, a store that just sells nothing but lights i'd be done with that at least they did in the 80s and early 90s i don't know if they're still around anymore yeah Hey, Lamps Plus, if you're still around, where's my check? <laughs> so I'm going to make this, this light basically coming out of this this guy. This would, uh, this could be a, a good excuse to actually use one of our planar lights. So we do have um, planar slash area lights uh, in the engine. Um, they're more expensive than normal lights, so we can't use too many of them. Um, they're also, they don't cast area shadows, which is uh, a, a bit of a limitation. So we try to only use them in in areas where um, it would be really noticeable if the specular highlight wasn't the shape of the, the light fixture itself. Um, so I'll try and see if it, if it makes sense for this spot here. I'm going to turn off the shadows because you can see you start getting like some really weird uh, artifacts. So let's turn that guy off. That's kind of cool because now the the reflection kind of matches up with um with the light source itself. Yeah. I spent thirty seconds trying to come up with a joke about the light being plain, and I I didn't I couldn't do it. <laughs> You can make it nice and boring, a boring <sighs> wet light. I'm just off. I'm off today. <laughs> and chat wasn't Have you had there your to coffee yet? Chat wasn't, <laughs> chat wasn't there to help me. All right. So I think by itself, this light's not not quite doing it for me. Um, so you can see, like, what I what I'm kind of looking for here is again, always trying to like pick out certain materials. Uh, and I'm getting like a little bit of light on the tops of these of this uh, kind of leather chair, but I just want to add another light a little bit higher up, kind of angled a little bit more down on this guy. Um, that's gonna that's gonna give me what I want, and then I'll try and position it so that I don't see like um, like an extra specular highlight. Uh, and in this case, I can add a little bit of shadows as well. Yeah, there we go. So 
Now, if someone was sitting there, they would look pretty cool. Um, alrighty, what else are we going to do? So yeah, we have 20, 20 minutes left. Wow, this is uh, uh, not going as fast. Or maybe <laughs> it just took a lot longer when I was setting this up initially. Um, no, it's, it's, okay. just, I, it's one of the realities every time we do this, every time we do one of these shows, it's it, work does not happen on an hour by hour basis. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, there's exactly. very few things in game development you can complete uh, yeah, in an hour. Wrap up. Nice and tidy in an hour, but it, I can do like maybe one of those uh, cooking shows and here's one I prepared earlier kind of moments. <laughs> but, uh, I think that maybe it's, maybe that's kind of cool, and then we'll we can spend a bit of time looking at like a nighttime. I'll do some some character lighting on on this guy here. Um, as I said, he's he's very untrustworthy of people coming by his uh, his little shack, so he's prepared. I've got a pistol as well. And oh, the other thing I, I really I was proud of this. He like he stole some of the transit signs from Lorville uh, and brought them back to his place. I'm gonna get a letter from the environment art team. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of things here that should not be <laughs> in the same location. All right, so I'm just going to turn on the, the stuff that I had done kind of last time, and I'll just run through a little bit of what I was looking at. So, again, like kind of finding areas um, in the location where there's like some interesting props or, or opportunities to add a little bit of kind of life. Um, so I thought having some like broken, broken lights hanging over by his, his T-shirts would be kind of cool. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from um, Erica Gagnon, who's uh, the art director from uh, uh, Deus Ex, uh, the new Deus Ex games, and um, we like to kind of do some kind of like light sculptures uh, in a similar kind of way that he's uh, that he's concepted and and that's in those games, um, and it kind of matches the the Hurston style. Like we took a lot of uh, the uh, Lorville CBD art style. Um, took a bit of uh, inspiration from from those concepts as well so uh, i thought that that kind of matched up with his uh his work desk he's uh he's a little bit lonely um so you got to have some some company for your tea party <laughs> when you when you're uh, tea party. taking a few too many substances out in the desert right, so yeah let's uh Let's have a look out here. Uh, just a reminder to folks who are submitting questions in the chat. Uh, Chris is a lighting artist. Uh, if your question is yeah. about process in in how to light a scene, those are the types of questions that are appropriate for Chris. If your question is gameplay related or even graphics related or engine related and stuff, which, which we've talked about to some extent, uh, those aren't questions that are appropriate That's, uh, for, for Chris. Uh, that's my jam. Yeah. See, see, see a lot of really good and really interesting questions. Unfortunately, Chris is not the person uh, for those, in case you're wondering, why are they answering, asking my question? Uh, I'd love geez. to answer it if I knew the answer. Yeah. Remember, this is an art process stream. So if your question is about the process of lighting a, a, a space, that's appropriate. If it's can we shoot out lights or stuff like that, or gameplay related stuff, is not the stream for that, unfortunately. Wrong, Chris. One day, maybe, one day I'll know enough about everything that I can just do every question that you've got. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is, just for the, the sake of lighting this guy, I'm going to set up uh, a camera that I can use here. Um, and the main reason for that is just that I want to... Uh, I want to get some nice uh, depth of field and separation on the background here. So I'm going to knock that down, crank up the focus distance a bit. See if I can find where that focal plane is. About right. Uh, we're missing some background there, so need a couple million kilometers of rendering distance. And I'm just going to try and angle this guy a little bit here. So, all right. So actually, it looks like just these these lights from the environment already do a, a pretty decent job. Um, but I'm going to get rid of those lights and kind of do something else, I think. 
uh, that's on this layer. It looks like it's probably the probe. A bit of uh, some redness from something. Uh, as a follow-up to oh, your uh, 280 uh, light source question, do do do, yeah. do VFX and and other intermittent light sources like that count against that number? Uh, they would. So if uh, if VFX um, was doing something, I don't know, like for example, like fireflies, and they were cut, they had light sources that they were giving off. Uh, that would all count towards that um, that limit. What I don't know though is if they were. I don't know if there's a difference between like GPU particles, if they were casting lights versus kind of the light entities that we place, if that kind of runs through a different system or not. Uh, but I would guess that they all kind of uh, follow the same uh, the same budget. Sorry, I just had to delete an inappropriate message in chat there. <laughs> all right. So right now I'm seeing like the my cube map is picking up a lot of red, and that's uh, from the the glow that's kind of built into the um, the structure here. So I'm actually just going to go in and I'm just going to kill the glow in the material, uh, just because I want a as clean a, a base as possible um, to light this guy's head. Uh, chat seems to think this is a uh, Clem's uh, a twin brother Cletus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is. Uh, Desert Klim. So I'm going to grab this glow and I'm going to kill it. There we go. And I'll rebake this guy. That's better. So there's a little bit of, uh, of light coming from these guys back here, but that'll be fine. I'm just going to add to it, I think. All right, so uh, when it comes to character lighting, it's it's, uh, I guess it's kind of similar to doing environment lighting, but um, obviously you've got a, a single thing to focus on, whereas in the environment you've got different camera angles, um, different points of interest, that kind of stuff. Uh, so for a, uh, a character, I'll start looking for a, a key light source. Um, and again, I don't have anything immediately motivating in the scene. I've got these guys back here, so I'll probably use that as a motivated uh, rim light. Uh, and I'm just going to do like a basic um, three-point lighting setup, which is kind of the the most common uh, way to light characters or to light humans in general. Finding a a good kind of brightness value for my for my key light, and turn it into a projector and shine it at him. Ooh and find where I want it to land. Something like that. Turn on shadows, of course. Get some nice uh, nice self-shadowing. I'll try and just move it around a little bit and see if I can find something kind of cool. Um, so I mean, like, for the, for the real Klim, you know, we had some very dramatic lights because that, uh, that kind of lent itself to his his CD environment. Um, so I'll do something a little bit similar. I mean, his face just just begs for some sinister looking lighting, so. Yeah, it cannot be understated how important lighting is, especially for character. It's like when, when you had it there and it was completely blown out, uh, you know, he just looked oh, yeah. kind of weird and off-putting, but now he looks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can you can light something really bad really easily. A, a nice kind of midpoint here. Let's let's go with this, um, and let's let's find a nice color. Um, it's always interesting kind of picking a color. Uh, sometimes you got to be careful because the more saturated you get, you can really start making human skin look really sick and uh, and dead. Um, What's the? Uh, let's go with something like from Mandy. That would be kind of cool. We've got a little bit of uh, frame rate slow down here. Is that is that happening in the engine, or is that just uh, our video chat? Uh, I moment? think it might just be the video. My frame rate's looking pretty good at the All moment. Right. Oh well, we're working with what we got. Yeah. All right, and now I'm gonna add an, uh, 
a light kind of to help help the rim light here. So, I mean, this is kind of exactly what you would do on a movie set as well. You'd hide something up off screen. Uh, if the lights themselves aren't enough, then you just kind of add a little bit extra. Uh, and in this case, I'm not going to use a color. I'm going to use an actual light temperature because we can basically pick uh, with our lights if we want to use like a gel, which would just be any kind of saturated RGB color. Uh, obviously, you can find the right colors in there, but it's a bit more difficult. Uh, or we also have like uh, proper light temperatures from like a 1000 to a 15K range. Um, but if I'm going to match these guys out there, they look like they're about 35K. All right. Let's go with that. Uh, so that's the rim light portion. We'll just keep it there for time's sake. And then just add a fill. And again, like with those ratios, it's so easy to just completely nuke it uh, with the fill light being too bright. So let's, let's bring that guy down. And maybe... Let's see, maybe this is like a slightly bluer. I always like playing with some really extreme lighting colors. Uh, maybe this is maybe this is like from the uh, from the sky actually. So let's jump out instead of coming from the bottom. I'm gonna bring this fill up. Kind of bring it out from the side. Yeah, that's kind of cool. There you go. So we get some nice, like, subsurface scattering in his ears from the rim light. Um, not loving my uh, my brake lights uh, key light here. So let's let's try and find something else. Let's just go with something kind of sickly warm. I mean, and as as with kind of everything in lighting, is like you can, you're never really done. You just kind of stop at some point when it looks good. <laughs> that's that is true of every that's, of that's every all, art all discipline. <laughs> there is, you know, it, I, I don't remember who had the original quote, but art is never finished; it's only abandoned. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So once the deadline hits, then then I'm done. But uh, yeah, you can you can tweak this stuff forever. So now what I'm looking for is, um, uh, if I turn this off and just go back into my camera, uh, his eyes are looking very flat and dead, and that's just because the, the placement of my lights just means that I'm not getting a specular highlight uh, catching in his eyes, uh, which is very common in, uh, in CG or computer graphics. So I'm just going to add a, a specific catch light just to help that out a little bit. Because um, without it, eyes start to look really dead. I gotta, I gotta find this the sweet spot. It's starting to come in now. Turn it way down. Yeah, there we go. All right. Now, as we demonstrated before, you, you, you're setting your lights now and getting the lights you want, and then you'll find fixtures to... Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in this case, like, maybe I'm I'm doing something for a cinematic. Uh, so, like, the, the, the pipeline for or workflow for lighting a cinematic is very different from what we would do in the PU. So... Uh, what we what we try and do is is make our characters look as good as possible all the time, uh, but you know the the difference between a a movie and a game uh, the primary difference obviously is that you can move around you can come at a character from any angle and uh, therefore the artist doesn't really have any true control over how the character looks um, in a movie you know everything is set up very very specifically in every single shot uh, and lights don't generally make sense like they're just kind of placed uh, in space around reflected that kind of stuff um, for lighting a game like if this was a, a game character that we were doing this uh, this light rig probably wouldn't work and I would have to kind of unfortunately kill 
kill everything I've just done, uh, weep a little bit, and then start again. And uh, in this case, I would um, try and find a way to to motivate that light uh, from the scene. So I'd, I'd pick a kind of a direction. Uh, so maybe maybe he's got like some lights hanging off of his um, off of his thing here. And then I'll try and see if I can make something like that work. Like this kind of gives him a little bit of a bit mysterious, kind of don't want to mess with him vibe. Uh, and then again, luckily because it's a sci-fi game, we can kind of we can justify having lights in places where most people wouldn't actually put lights. So if I put a light on the floor, um, kind of like how I had in in the original lighting setup, you can have something down here and now. Now, if this was like kind of game lighting or like in-game lighting, it would be a little bit closer to something like this, uh, and then we can kind of tweak things a little bit more. Um, we just have a little bit less of that that really fine control, like specifically with uh, putting in a um, a an eye catch light, like uh, for the specular highlights on his eyes. That's a lot more hard, uh, a lot harder to uh, to motivate in an actual level design kind of sense of lighting. Cool. Yeah, that's uh that's kind of cool there. So yep. right. that light go. I had a light in here. Oh well, it's uh, lost to the ages. Got that. And I think finally we'll just pull the sun up. And let uh, Cletus Klim bask in the uh, the morning glow of another day. Yeah, there we go. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, anytime. Taking us through a bit of your process. I mean, obviously, you know, every time we do one of these shows, whether it's lighting or props or weapons or characters or whatever, uh, you can't fit the uh, you can't fit the entire process in the space of an hour. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, but, there's so much more that I could do. Yeah. Um, so many different angles that you can uh, approach this stuff from. So. But we do appreciate the the, the scratching the surface, if you will, uh, taking us exactly. through this. Um, you can, you can go ahead and uh, uh, stop the screen share. Uh, that's it for the show this week, guys. Uh, as we are, as we like to do here, we are going to throw the uh, raid to a Star Citizen streamer who is streaming right now. Uh, my understanding is that it is HC Vertigo, uh, who I haven't seen in quite some time. I, 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 I've, I've met HC Vertigo a couple of times. Um, he's a pretty good streamer. I, I think he's mining uh, right now. So. Um, when you, if you want to join in the raid, you can hit the little button at the top of the chat and you join the raid. And uh, when you get there, uh, everybody scream, turn the lights on! <laughs> He'll have absolutely no idea uh, what's going on. Uh, for, uh, for Star Citizen Live, uh, I'm Jared. Uh, that's Chris. Join us uh, next week uh, for a very special Ship Showdown Live. Uh, it's going to be different. Uh, until then, we'll see you then. Uh, take care. Uh, be safe. And uh, keep on trucking. I don't know. See you, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Jared. <laughs> Bye. Know.